this time I'd like to welcome Pastor Soso up to the front. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How many of you are excited in the house? It's a season of excitement. We are just so blessed. We, I and Dr. Faye just came back from a, a leaders conference um, in Omaha, Nebraska. And it's just so beautiful to know that God is everywhere. God is not just in your home church. God is everywhere. And we are just so blessed to be partakers of what God is doing there. We're excited about and believing God for the next 10 days. The word was released there. And we're just excited about it now nine days. Um, and <laughs> we're going to be sharing the testimonies of what God has done and what God is doing um, after the next nine days. Um, the fast is also going to be ending in nine days. Um, for, so for some of you who didn't have a reason to fast, I want you to key into that real quick. Um, you want to share something? No, I just wanted to just share the fact that we are really connected to an amazing spiritual legacy. Um, so our pastors are Jamon and Erica Glenn, who are based out of Michigan. Their pastors are the Williams, Martin and Linnell Williams, and his pastor was Miles Monroe. And so their spiritual uh, uh, father now in the Lord is Tudor Bismarck, and he was there, um, as well as several others. And the level of impartation that we received from fathers this past week is literally unmatched. And one of the things, I miss Dr. Jamal's session, which he always pairs it up. He taught on mantles. And he talked about how when you are part of um, a legacy, when you're part of a family, the victories of your spiritual mothers and fathers become your victories. The battles that they have won become battles you don't have to fight. And so we can now step into the inheritance of the, our fathers' victories and their fathers' victories and the great men and women of God by mutual of covenant. We said this is our spiritual covering, this is our father, and now we get to be partakers of not only his victories but those that have gone before him so we are just super excited and we're going to be sharing some more of what the Lord did this previous week Amen, Amen Thank you, give the Lord a hand I sure would have omitted all of that if she had not come up I'm not good at, I'm not good at telling stories <laughs> I'm so disjointed. My, my mind is so focused on just the, the main point. But um, God is just, it's really, really good. I'm excited. Um, if you know me very well, you know I don't get easily excited. Um, but I am excited about this season. I'm excited about what God is doing. And God is just amazing. He is amazing. Um, we, yeah, let's go into the message for today. Um, there's going to be time for us to just press in. And praise God for what he's doing. Culture wars. Um, I apologize that we do not have projection today. We are experiencing um, a bit of technical difficulties. If you have your phones, your iPads, your mobile devices, if you just go and type lcc.onechurchsoftware.com. lcc.onechurchsoftware.com. Log in. If you haven't created a profile, go ahead and create one and log in. If you have created a profile, go ahead and log in and join us. Go to the go on the more section and go on the sermons. You should have a, a notepad that will pull up with a few lesson points there. I want you to follow up as we proceed. We're going to get accustomed to using 21st century technology. <laughs> let's, let's get accustomed to 21st century technology. It is not off the devil. All knowledge proceeds from God. Yeah. You may be shy about it. You may not like it. You may be scared about it. But the enemy catches wind of it, uses it. And way after he has fully used and utilized it, we now catch a glimpse of it. You know what? Maybe we can use that. Well, let us be the forerunners. Let us be forerunners of technology to praise God and to move the kingdom of God forward. So we're going to be talking about cultures, culture, the culture in politics. Um, this month, we are dealing with culture wars, the, the wars that is being waged against our spirituality, the wars that are being waged against, waged against us as children of the kingdom of God, 
as children of light, we are consistently battling ideas, culture. Culture is a moving trend. Culture changes. It morphs. It is, it is advancing. Whether it's advancing in a positive trend or negative trend, we are consistently changing, upgrading, downgrading, moving our positions on things. And so I want to talk today about culture of politics because we all live in it. It is our reality. Some of us don't like politics. Some of us cannot even watch the news, right? Because we feel like, oh, no, this is just too much for me. It is too much negativity. It is too much complaints. It is just too much. But you live in that atmosphere. Whether you like it or not, it affects you. Whether you choose the leader or not, they decide what happens to your life. And so politics is as important to our life as almost anything else. And so we need to understand what are the cultural undertones, what are the cultural trends that are against the principles of God in our lives. It wouldn't be a problem if, if all of culture is in the will of God. We, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't bother about that because it's in the will of God and so we follow whatever trend there is. But if the trends of politics is against the will of God in our lives, then we have to pause, we have to assess, and we have to decide how to proceed. We live in a democratic government, which is a beautiful thing. We all can express our opinions. We all have rights, freedom of speech. And it is the beautiful, beautiful thing. Now, I, think, I think our democracy in this country is the most advanced democracy, the most robust democracy in the world. Yeah. And so we can say things. Uh, I came from a country where you couldn't ask, you can't speak as freely as we speak in this country. When I came here, I embraced it. I am like, yeah, I love this. You know, you can talk, you can dream, you can criticize, you can, you can do all of this. this is, these are beautiful things, right? These are beautiful things. But you will, one of the things that you observe is that as we talk and as we discuss and as we share our opinions, we, our opinions begin to coalesce. It begins to come together into main frames, right? Either for this or against it. And then oftentimes, we, a lot of us, uh, a majority of us form an opinion on a topic, form an opinion on any political agenda, any particular topic, we form an opinion and, and it becomes the strong voice. You see t trends, political trends come and go. But because we all agree, because we all politically agree, based on whatever criteria we chose or by whatever criteria we arrived at that decision, that does not mean it's the voice of God. It does not mean that God takes glory in that situation. It doesn't mean that that is kingdom politics. It doesn't mean that God approves of our politics, even though the majority of us believe it. Even though the majority of us stand for it. It doesn't mean that it's kingdom politics. It doesn't mean that God approves of it. And so we are continuously evolving. We are morphing. I see changes all the time in our immigration policy, in our economic policy, um, in the trade wars that's going on right now. I mean, on any particular topic. Some of us don't even care. We don't even know what's happening, right? But I think you should watch the news because Scripture says watch and pray. If you ain't watching, you don't know what to pray about. Oftentimes, we're just concerned about our needs. I just need a job. I just need food. Well, you got to pray about the country that you live in. You got to pray about the leadership of the country you live in. You got to pray for wisdom on how to decide on any issue yeah. in the country. Yeah. So we are, we are consistently forming, we're consistently forming new opinions. And we're all coalescing. Our opinions are coming together. And one trend that I see that is worrisome for me is that we are adopting as Christians, as believers, we are adopting certain mainframe understanding, certain, certain political positions as the emblem of the church. As typical of the church. As the expectation of believers. Amen. And so somebody is going to, you're going to talk to somebody and they're going to ask you, oh, what, what, what do you think of it? Who are you voting for? If you tell them you're voting one party, it's almost like, are you a believer? Almost as though, if I'm a believer, I must vote this way. Now the interesting thing is, depending on what stream you are, if you are from certain streams, Almost everybody votes a particular way. If you are in the certain streams, almost everybody sees things a particular way. Yeah. And so there's, there's a phenomenon called identity politics. Yeah. Identity politics is, is a political position where people coalesce, so people come together based on common interest. Yeah. Oftentimes, it's an interest to emancipate them from their suffering. And so if we're all suffering or all part of an, an economic, social economic class or reality, 
we come together, first acknowledge our deficiencies and our problems, and then we begin to say, well, why don't we do something about it? Yeah. And so our goal of doing something about it is to create a voice, to agitate, to fight, and to get deliverance. And then we, that becomes our identity. And sometimes even when we're not struggling or when we're not anymore in that position, we still have that identity that we started struggling with. Yeah. Come on. But as believers, as believers, our goal, what we represent, the emblem of the church, the political position of the church, again, this is not a sermon to teach you or to say you got to vote one way or the other, no. one candidate or the other. That is not what we're trying to do here. I, do, I prefer that we have different inclinations when it comes to government and, and politics and all of that. But I need all of us to understand that as believers, we have a different frame of mind. Our framework, the way we view the world is different from the way unbelievers view the world. We, we, we think from the kingdom. We are kingdom citizens. We rule and reign within. So our perspective every time is from the kingdom of God yeah. looking down. Yeah. Kingdom of God looking down. Yeah. It's kingdom citizens. You know, as, as a citizen of the kingdom of God, you have one agenda. Yep. One. And your agenda is the agenda of your king. Yes. <laughs> your agenda is the agenda of your king. Amen. If you live in a kingdom and you have a separate agenda from the agenda of the king, you're committing treason. And you know what happens when you commit treason? In a real monarchy society, I know we've, we, we, we've, we've, we've gone past that point right now. We're so civilized these days. But a few hundred years ago, if you commit treason, you, you, you've been killed. They, they, they take you out. And so if we understand that we are kingdom citizens, we cannot have a, an agenda different from the agenda of God. I don't care what social economic background you come from. It does not matter where you were born. It doesn't matter what your zip code says. Your, your identity, your political identity cannot be the identity of man. It has to be kingdom. 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 I want you guys to write down these three points. If you've opened up your lesson plan, you would see these three questions there. And I want you guys to wrestle with this when you go back home. The church is not supposed to teach or to influence politics one way or the other. So this is not our goal, but I want you guys to arrive at the decisions. And so I'm going to ask you, the first question is, what is true leadership from God's perspective? What is true leadership from the perspective of God? How does God see true leadership? Second question is, is God interested in your politics? Is God interested in politics? Number three, is God more pleased with one party or movement than others? Is God more pleased with one political party or movement than others? You know, oftentimes when we look at politics, we look at it from our perspective, from our reality. And most of us, the only two political parties we've ever known, or three political parties we've ever known, is the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, and the Independent Party. Because we're born, raised, live in this country. It's a beautiful thing. I mean, people will give their lives to have what you have. So that in, that's in no, I'm not trying to minimize that. But politics is not just unique to America. Politics is a political system. It's, it's an ideology. It's a process that evolves of governance. The way humans try to govern one another. And so we have lots and lots of political system. We have communism. We have socialism. We have what we have here, democracy, we have fascism, we have progressivism, we have, uh, um, um, I mean, socialism. We have all of these isms around the world that man has de devised to say, how do we rule? But is this the plan of God? You should ask yourself, I mean, you should pause something and ask yourself, on what side is God? Is God on the democratic side or is he on the republican side or is God an independent what side does God sit on? And I know if I wasn't, if I wasn't presenting this sermon and I asked this question in a different way, most of us would arrive at the answer that God is a particular party. If the question is tuned a certain way, if I, if I present the question a certain way, 
you will unknowingly answer that God is of one political party. God's original plan, its initial plan was to rule and reign with man. Theocracy, there was supposed to be just one God, one party. And that party is the party of the kingdom of God. Party of the kingdom of God. And so we were supposed to rule and reign with him. It was supposed to be our God, still our God, but was supposed to be our king. And we're subjects to him. No affiliations apart from him. No agenda apart from his. No plans apart from his. No policies apart from his. No inclinations apart from his. It was supposed to be our all. And man fell. When man fell, and man divorced himself from God's leadership, rulership, communion, man, God gave man permission to self-rule. Permissions to rule one another. And so man devised methods, methodologies, systems, organizational systems to better administrate one another. And God didn't stop that because God is a God of order. Without government, there will be chaos. The chief principal reason government does is to administer and to what? Prevent chaos. And so without government, there will be chaos. So God allowed government in different dispensations and time. But if we go back to the earliest political system we have, the very first political party that was formed at the Tower of Babel was a political system that wanted to, wanted to preserve itself. It was a political system that wanted to get up to God. Almost like challenge God. Scripture says in the book of Genesis 11.4. Genesis 11.4. They said, let us come together. If you read Genesis 11, it first of all talks about how they advanced technologically. How they started building brick and making mortar out of butamen. So you can see the progression of development. But it got to a point where the, you know, the, they began to have a common understanding, a common political view. You know, how about we create a tower that, that gets up to heaven? The interesting thing is they said this, that reaches to the heavens so that we can make a name for ourselves. We can make a name for ourselves. This spirit of making a name for oneself is the same spirit behind every political party that has ever existed. Has ever existed. Political parties always start small with noble causes. We want to fight for the, for the poor. We want to fight for the, for the broken hearted. They sound so beautiful and noble. And then when they get to the point of of subsistence, once they get to the point of establishment, they want to retain power. They want to retain power. They want that to become the norm. And so you see that there is a continuous effort, continuous machinations to remain in power. The goal of politics is to seize power and remain in control. Don't get, don't get sidetracked by the beautiful stories your political party tells you. Don't get sidetracked by the bullet points. Those bullet points were well architectured yeah. to catch your attention. They were well scripted. People wrote that. They checked your politics. They checked your demograph demographics. They checked your socioeconomic background. They understand that people in particular, people groups, people in particular, socioeconomic class, tend to think a particular way. And so they script ideas and ideologies for us. And we take them on, and we believe they are, they are ours, they are our politics. But the goal of that political party, no matter how noble it sounds, watch them. When they get in power and they establish themselves in power, the next thing they want to do is to consolidate power. And then they start oppressing the other voices. They start oppressing the other voices. Go read Wall History. Go read the, 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 the biggest... Uh, the, the, the biggest crisis we had, World War I, started because Germany was trying to oppress the rest of the world with the German nationalism. German nationalism, when it started, did not start to oppress the Jews. 
It did not start to make anybody else feel less than. It started to emancipate the German people. And they said, let us come on together. Let us, let us speak with one voice. Let us make the German people proud. Let us make the German people prosperous. Let, let us make the German people feel like they belong. Let, let, us, let us give them hope. And then they started gathering the small communities around Germany. And they fought off the, 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 Euro, the other European forces. Is it Greek? I think it's probably Greek or Roman. One of those um, forces. But when they overcame, they thought, you know what? We, we, we can evolve. And then that nationalism progressed to a point of racism yeah. and anarchy. Yeah. So the platform that you see Nazi, when we talk about it and you hear it, it just comes with a very wrong connotation. When it started, it started with a good cause. <laughs> I want you guys to understand that. When it started, it started with a good cause. But because of the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's why you got to be very careful when you affiliate yourself with any political party. Your leaders, you can't trust their heart. If you can't trust the heart of man, you cannot identify yourself with it. The only identity I have is of the kingdom of God. Because I trust the heart of a father. That is always good. There is no, scripture says there is no variableness in him. There is no shadow of turning in him. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is predictable, he is dependable. If I must die for something, I want to die for kingdom agenda. Not for the agenda of any man. Not for the agenda of any political party. Not for the agenda of any man who sits somewhere and come out and tell me what they want me to hear. I want to die for kingdom agenda. Scripture says in Genesis 6, 6, 3, God says, The Lord, my spirit, would not strive or remain with man forever. Because indeed, he is flesh, corrupt, given over to sensual appetites. Nevertheless, his days shall be as a hundred years, 120 years. So God just, he just gets tired of striving with us, striving with man, trying to establish his order with man. People say, how come we have so many political systems and how come we have so, so many, uh, you go to certain countries, I mean, <laughs> children, I mean, you are able to dream because of peace. Yeah. The reason why you have five-year goal, ten-year goal, ten-year plans oh. is because you have peace in your country. I don't want you to take this for granted. Yeah. If you were but born in a, another country, I mean, just pause for, for an instance. If you just were born in a different country where your survival, your daily survival is dependent on the whims and the caprices of your president. If he wants to prove a point internationally, it just releases chemical weapons. I mean, Im imagine, imagine that. I want you guys to pause and imagine how important this is. Leadership is so important. And we need to be very careful and understand. If you look globally and look at what is happening, you will be able, you will pray more about your government, for your government. Whatever you think, whatever your political position is, whatever your preferences are, you understand that the peace of your nation depends on your prayers. And you're going to pray. Every time you see something you don't like, instead of condemning it, you go on your knees and you pray. Yeah. Man has always devised political systems to solve a problem. Capitalism was started to emancipate economically, give people, give people an opportunity to have wealth. The founding fathers, when they came here, Coming from under the rulership of, of England, they, want, they wanted to have something for themselves. We all want to get something for ourselves. Then we've gotten to the point where we've lost touch and sympathy for the poor. We've gotten to the point where we want to make profit on the back of everybody. It doesn't matter where you are, where you come from. We don't care. It's all about profit. Yeah. Capitalism. It's that system of government. Socialism. Oh, we want to redistribute wealth. 
They want to take wealth from the wealthy and give it to the poor. Every political system that man has devised is imperfect. It's imperfect. The reason why I'm laying this foundation is I know some of us identify ourselves when we look at ourselves, when we're in a discussion or anywhere, we see ourselves first as somebody from a political party. Some of us have defined our political affiliation based on our economic situation. You know you can vote a particular way and still not be of that party. Mm -hmm. Let me me, me help you with that first. You're not of a particular political party. You are of the kingdom of God. You are of the kingdom of God. There is a reason why when you do the elections, and this is not just us. It's everybody else. All, All the demographics. There's a reason why we all align towards our preferred political parties. Because we believe that it sustains us. We believe in a common identity that we have formed in it. But these identities are not the identity of the kingdom of God. And as Christians, you cannot take up the identity of man when you claim to be citizens of the kingdom of God. When you claim to be citizens of the kingdom of God, there are one ambition of politics. Politics has one ambition. That ambition is to gain power and to keep power. The oppressed, when you hear them talk, they're forming a political party, you feel empathy for them. But give them 10 years, give them 15 years. <laughs> give them 20 years, give them 30 years. When they get in power, maybe even the founding fathers may maintain it. But when the next generation of people come, the point is to enmesh and to retain power. And they'll do anything to keep power. They'll do anything to keep power. A lot of us don't know the backhand of politics. We don't know what, what, what decisions and the sort of things that they do behind to get into office. And I'm not saying that everybody's a sinner. I'm not saying that you can't have a godly politician. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is political parties and political movements and ideologies are based on man-made ideas. Man-made ideas. There's a joke that says a honest politician, if you want to find an honest politician, is one who, when bought, stays bought. You guys didn't get the joke. Every politician has a price. <laughs> Every politician has a price. And that's not to say that they do not believe in their agenda. They believe strongly in the agenda of their party. But the problem is no political party fully encapsulates the nature of God. No political party fully encompasses God's agenda. So why then will I affiliate myself or make myself one political party, stand by what it is? I mean, some of us don't even think about it anymore. If we are part of this political party, it don't matter. (laughs) We don't even ask a question. We just go to the polls and we just thumb it. We just got to win. We just press it. What are you voting for? What is the principle you're voting on? What are you trying to promote? We're trying to promote kingdom agenda. And scripture says in Romans 14, for the kingdom of God is not about meat or drink, food. It's not about your comfort. I know we need a little bit of something. I know in certain demographics, we need more schools, better, better institutions. We need better programs. I, I understand all of that. And we can still speak for those things because it's the kingdom of God yeah. in those regards. Yeah. But for us to become blinded because of the things that we need in a particular season, or because of our earthly need and our financial needs or our socioeconomic needs, place, we take upon ourselves the identity of a political movement that is alienated to the identity of the kingdom of God. And yet we call ourselves Christians. We call ourselves believers, children of the king. And yet we are not perpetuating the plan of God in the earth. Man's pursuit for idealism, write this down. Man's pursuit for idealism always leads to extremism. 
Man's pursuit for idealism, the ideal environment we want, the, the ideal political climate we want, always leads to extremism. There's always somebody who's going to come and wants to push the political front, want to push our, our understanding, our culture to an extreme position. There's always somebody who's going to come to push us to, an, to another place, to a... To a, to a to a more critical and more extreme position on any issue, on any issue. And we're going to take a few issues, and we're going to take a look at it. Now, the question is, Jesus lived in a time that was political. There was always politics, even in the time of Jesus. So Jesus lived throughout a time that was political. There was the Roman Empire that had influence around the area. And then we had the Jewish political system that consisted of the Sadducees, the leadership, the Sanhedrin consisted of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then yet there's another third group called the Essenes. And these people had political ideologies. They had preferences. They had things they believed in as a political movement. The way they, the way they voted, the way they did things, they approached the perspective dependent on their political party. But Jesus, when he, when he was dealing with these people, he, he, he wasn't scared to deal with their political ideologies. Jesus wasn't scared to be confrontational. We always look at Jesus and he appears to be the meek father, the father of peace, the lamb of God that sits upon the throne. Scripture says that when Jesus came into the temple and he found the merchants selling in the temple, he overturned the tables and whipped them out. That was a capitalist system that was taking root and getting root in the church, in the house of God. And Jesus made it clear to them that you cannot bring your capitalism into the kingdom of God. It's okay for us to sell outside because we, that's what we believe in as a nation. Scripture didn't say they whip people out of the market. It's okay to sell in the market. That's, that's what you sell. That's what you sell your wares. It's okay to do business. Jesus don't have a problem with capitalism. I don't have a problem with capitalism. But you cannot bring your capitalism into the church into the temple, into the presence of God. The sacred places. And I feel like in this generation, our political movement, we are eroding everything that is sacred. Everything that is sacred. There's a political correctness. You can't say certain things the way you would say them. Half of us talk differently in our home than we talk out, outside. My wife knows me. I don't make comments on Facebook because if I do, people are going to be, they're just going to come at me. Because I'm not going to say what you want to hear. Yeah. I'm not, I don't even know how to talk like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so we have, we've developed po political correctness. Safe zones, safe way of communicating. But what we forget is it's affecting the way we view life. And the way the coming generation view life. Yeah. And if there's nothing secret to you, there's nothing secret to that generation. All the, the principles, spiritual principles, the enemy is attacking every single one of it. And we, because we are, part, we, are, we are party affiliates, because we see ourselves as part of a party, some of us, and the, the interesting thing is you're still going to vote for them one way or the other. I tell people, I can, I can look at a, at, a, at a leader and tell you, you know what, I'm going to vote for you. And you know why I'm going to vote for you? Just because of one, two, three that you stand for. But I'm going to tell you to your face that I also don't like one, two, three that you do. The problem is nobody criticizes. Nobody speaks up the voice or the vision of God. If I'm part of a party, I agree with everything the party does. You can only be in total agreement with one kingdom. And that kingdom starts for, stands for righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That is the only kingdom that you can be 100% in affiliation with. That is the kingdom that you can stand for, you can speak for, you can die for. It's the kingdom of God. Every other man-made kingdom depends on my interpretation of what is happening based on the kingdom of God. If you're in alignment with what is happening in the kingdom of God, I am for you. But I'm going to make it clear to you that the reason I'm with you is because my Heavenly Father approves of it. If you come up with another idea that is outside of the kingdom of God, I am not with you. 
Some of us, because of our political, social political situations, and I do not want to give details, but you know it. You know the reason why you vote a certain way. We know why we vote a certain way. This goes both ways. Any party. If you're a little wealthy and you get good tax cuts, then you vote to preserve your tax cuts. If you're in a particular social economic um, um, place and you, you get hates and you get whatever, you vote to preserve it. The issue is not whether or not you, you can ever vote to preserve help and aid to the poor. Because the heart of a father is to preserve the poor. If you'll turn with me to Jeremiah 7. Jeremiah 7, 5. Scripture says, for if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly execute justice one with another, if you do not oppress the sojourner, in your country, the fatherless or the widow, yeah. if you do not shed innocent blood yeah. in, the, in this place, and if you do not go after other gods yeah. to your own harm, then I will let your people dwell in this place, in the land that I have given to your fathers of old. So God is very clear about his position regarding the orphans, the widows, the poor. So if you are benefiting from certain political policies that give aid to the poor, the reason why you should vote for it again is not because you were benefiting from it. Yeah. It's because it is the kingdom agenda to help the poor. I want you guys to understand this. Because we have been trained, raised to always vote from our political perspective what benefits from us, what benefits us. Political systems are created to Preserve agendas, yeah. preserve preferences, preserve needs. Yeah. Preserve your needs. Yeah. And you may be in this situation where we, we, we are kingdom citizens. <laughs> I'm so excited about that. I understand that you may be in a position now where you, you need a little bit of aid from the government. It is kingdom of God to help the poor, the orphans, the needy. But you should never remain there. Yeah. God did not create you to be in a place where you only receive. Yeah. Yeah. You heal, you grow skills, yeah. you, you, you learn, you develop, yeah. you become wealthy, and then help the poor. Yeah. Yeah. The reason is why the reason you vote a particular way is because you just want that system to remain that way it is, so it will continuously benefit you. You are, <laughs> you need to change your agenda. Change your plans. Change your perspective. If you are benefiting from a system that gives tax cuts to the wealthy, and then you will do anything to preserve your benefits. You don't want new people, you don't want new skill sets to come into the country because you feel like they're going to compete with you. You do everything to suppress other people just because you want to stay on the top. You will vote a particular way to stay on top. You need to change your ways. Yeah. Your political agenda should be the agenda of the kingdom of God. Yeah. As believers, the question then is, how then do we participate in politics? Do we even participate in politics? And there are certain people who teach people that, oh, no, it's of the world, don't touch it. Well, you have to participate in politics. Yeah. Because essentially, it is the way you are governed. Whether you are passive about it, or you are active in it, it affects your life. The people who get elected will direct the course of your lives. The people who get elected can start a program. They can end a program. They can execute injustice in the land. They can do anything. And you inherit it. There's little you can do. There's next to nothing you can do about it. Scripture says in the book of Timothy, if you go up and read, 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4. You would think that with all the negativities in all the political systems that we have, you would think that with all the shortcomings we have in all the different political systems that God will tell you do not vote or don't pray for the leaders that is, on, that is sinful. Uh, choose only pray for the righteous leader. 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4. 
Scripture says, first of all, then, I heard that I heard that all petitions, petitions, specific requests, prayers and intercessions, and thanksgiving be offered on behalf of all people. All people. Not part of your solution, your 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 political class, not part of your political preference, that you should make intercessions and prayers for all people. Yeah. But it didn't just end with all people. It says verse 2. And I'm reading from the, from the Amplified Version. For kings and for all who are in positions of high authority. All people in positions of high authority. You'd be like, God, why would I even vote for this person? Why, why, why do I want to vote for them? Well, let's read on. So that we may lead in a peaceful and quiet life. So that we may lead... Another version says, live in a peaceful and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Yeah. In all godliness and dignity. And oftentimes we take it for granted that we've lived in a country that has known peace for a long time. And we don't understand what it means for the leader of your nation <laughs> to be sensible. And so if we have a political point or a political position that we do not agree with, we would curse them. Mm -hmm. Come on. We will lambast them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Write posts about them. Say all sorts of negative things. But what you don't know is you are cursing your destiny. Yeah. Your destiny is closely tied with the leaders and the rulers or the kings yeah. that rule over you. Yeah. And some of us get very spiritual about this. I want you to go read the scripture about David and when David heard against God. And the prophet Nathan was going to come to correct David. The prophet Nathan did not just go there and say, you know what, David, you done messed up. You don't just, you just be acting a fool around here. I, I, in fact, I, I'm giving you the word of the Lord. Well, if you were coming and had done that, prophet Nathan would have told you that. And I want you guys to be very careful where I'm coming from. If you were coming and had did that, prophet Nathan would have told you, you done messed up. You crazy. Why did you do that? But because of the elevation and the position and the calling of the position as king, yeah. even a prophet, when he approached the king, did not curse him. He had to give a story. He had to lead the king to see what he was saying without actually saying it. This is a prophet that God asked to go speak on his behalf. I want you guys to understand this because we're so quick to open our mouths. This is a prophet that God says, go correct the king. When he went into the presence of the king, and I guess that's why we don't like the monarchy system in this country. We like the democratic system. But what we don't understand is spiritual principles apply regardless of your political affiliations or understanding of systems. A ruler is a ruler. A king is a king. A president is a president. You don't like what they do, you cannot curse them. You can speak up, but you got to be very inventive and very prayerful in the way you speak. I'm not saying that you cannot speak up. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. But you do not curse them because when you curse them, you're cursing your nation. You're cursing your destiny. Come on. Come on. And this is in the scripture. It's not my word. So you don't feel like, you know, it's just, it's just making things up. You got to pray for people in high positions in authority. Why? Because your peace depends on it. Because your dignity depends on it. There are parts of this world where people live without dignity. No human dignity. No clothes to cover their bodies. No food to eat. When you see the way they, they, they drive them, they drive them around like, like herds, like somebody dealing with herds. No human dignity. Do not take for granted the system you live under. People gave their lives yeah. for this. Yeah. Don't, don't take it for granted. Yeah. How do we deal with our political, current political, cultural issues? And that's what we're trying to do. The goal of this is how do we deal with the cultural issues that we're dealing with right now? The, the political issues that are cultural. How do, we, how do we divide it? How do we, how do we lean on? What, what do we vote for? What do we do? Taxes. Taxation is one. one. A lot of people vote on taxation. 
And I'm not going to tell you to vote for one party or the other. But I want you guys to understand that taxation is something that even Jesus had to deal with. Jesus is the king of kings. He's the maker of the heavens and earth. When the devil came to tempt him, he told him, you cannot tempt the Lord your God. All of creation is mine. But when he was confronted by man in the system of man, whether or not he paid taxes, Jesus did not claim to be God and so he won't pay taxes. Jesus understood that his kingdom is beyond taxation. But because the kingdom of man need taxation to run properly, he said, you go get them the four dramas, drachmas, and give it to them for our taxes. You cannot evade tax because you don't like the political order. <laughs> you cannot. You got to pay your taxes. It's a, it's, a, it's a cultural norm that we are, and, and, and this goes the other way. Giving tax breaks to the wealthy so that they can vote back for you. Lobbying for tax breaks. What is the kingdom of God? What, what, what's the heart of God concerning this? And we have formed and we keep forming political ideologies. Identity politics, and I want to talk about this. Identity politics is a political approach and analysis based on people prioritizing the concerns most relevant to them. Concerns most relevant to them, to their particular racial, religious, ethnic, sexual, social, cultural, and other identity. And the forming of an exclusive political alliance or li alliances with others of this group. This is how people evolve in their political identity. And how people see themselves as one somebody of one political party than the other. That oftentimes when you start, you started with something that you thought was really relevant to you. Something of high importance to you. For some of us, it's the economics. For some of us, it's the so social, social implication. The cry for justice. Social justice is a cultural move in this time. And social justice is such a big thing in this time. And I can match along with somebody fighting for social justice. But if you give me a minute to, to explain, or you give me a minute to ask me why you are here, I'm going to tell you I'm here not because. My God is a God of social justice. I'm here because my God is a God of justice, period. You guys, you didn't, you didn't understand that. If there is need to march with people fighting for emancipation because they are oppressed, yeah. I will fight with them. Yeah. Because the kingdom of God is righteousness, yeah. peace, yeah. and joy in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And so I will align myself and fight for the emancipation, but I'm not there because my God is just a God of social justice. Mm -hmm. And so when we get social justice, we relax. Mm -hmm. Our goal is to bring the kingdom of God on earth. Scripture says when Jesus was teaching the disciples how to pray, he says, let your kingdom come on earth, even as it is in heaven. So if the kingdom of God is to be on the march for social justice, you get on the march for social justice. If the kingdom of God is to speak up for life of kids killed, you get up and you speak for them. If the kingdom of God is to go into the prisons and pray for reformation and prison reform and laws to be changed, so that even men who have done a mistake in the past can get a second chance to life. You get on the march. You don't affiliate yourself to a particular political position and call yourself pro-life. And you're only pro-birth. And every other person who has lived or because they've made a mistake or because they're incarcerated, they are less than humans. The kingdom of God that I serve, the kingdom that I serve is the kingdom of second chances. It's a kingdom that brings life and brings life more abundantly. It's a kingdom that cares about the unborn child, cares about the child in the womb, but also cares about the man in the prison. It's the kingdom of God that cares about every single one of us. Don't form a political ideology because something suits your hearing. What is the kingdom of God concerning this? What is the full perspective of God on this issue. So I will match to save lives. 
I will march because I believe in pro-life. I believe in pro-birth. But I also march because I believe in the life of every man, every woman, every child in this country. Because that is the kingdom of God. That is the fullness of the kingdom of God. So we don't limit our political ideologies based on a party's agenda. And some parties will, will fight for birth because we think it's a sin. We know it's a sin to murder child, children, but we don't have the same empathy and the same care and the same love and the same concern for the ones alive. They can live in the ghettos. They can live in the shanties. You can give them a different zone, zip, zip code. You can come up with policies that have great schools in great neighborhoods. And yet we're Christians. We're believers. We can speak in tongues. We can do all these great things. But our heart is not pure. Our heart is not pure. We believe what we believe. We will give anything to defend it. But is this is the kingdom agenda? Is this the heart of God? And I'm hoping that when you leave here, this is one thing that you would do. I, I hope that everybody here was, you know, old enough to vote will vote Every time you have an opportunity. This is, not, this is not a sermon that will teach you to re- reclude yourself or seclude yourself from voting. That's not what this is for. You need to participate in the political system of the country. Yeah. But I, I am hoping that the spirit of God will come so heavy on you that you will cease to see yourself from one political lens. You are not an independent first. You were not a Republican first. You were not a Democrat first. You were first a citizen of the kingdom of God. And your heart is to establish the will of him who sent you. Jesus, when he was asked, says, my job, my food, my life, what gives me life is to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus taught the disciples about the kingdom of God. So let your kingdom come. Jesus did not say, let the community of, of, of God pr- prosper. He didn't say, let the sick prosper. Like, you know, my job is to, well, yes, his job is to break the chains, to, to deliver the, the poor, and to, and to break, you know, yes, all of that in the book of Isaiah. But when he was asked out to pray, he didn't just pray for the poor. And I want you guys to understand this. Because our politics have been affected by our social economic positions. By our, our economic realities. Jesus did not just pray for the wealthy or for the poor. He prayed that the kingdom of God will come. He says, let your kingdom come on earth. Even as it is in heaven. Let your will be done. And so how do we know the will of God? Because that's the question I expect everybody here should act, to ask. How do I know the will of God on every situation? How do I know what to vote and what not to vote for? It's in the Holy Ghost. Somebody say it's in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Scripture says the kingdom of God is what? Righteousness and peace. We joy in. 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 The Holy Ghost. You cannot have righteousness outside of the Holy Spirit. You cannot have righteousness outside the leading of the Holy Spirit. The first service Dr. Faith was sharing that God's heart sometimes is emphatic on certain issues. He's a God of order. He's a God that remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. But one thing I know about God is God is not a dogmatic God. God is a God of all seasons. <laughs> because the interesting thing is even the things that we think we're fighting for are noble causes. Even those things, if you really look in there, you will see one or two people that are oppressed by what you're fighting for. Wow. I mean, pick any issue. Pick any issue. Don't just talk based on your benefit. Look at everybody involved with that situation. Wow. Capitalism has a system of government. There are certain people who pay the price for us to be this wealthy. Wow. Developed nations will keep impoverished nations poor. So that they can develop products to sell to them. Don't let me go into <laughs> international politics and all of that. 
But a lot of us just get carried away with, you know, oh, I'm good, I got jobs. What is the job index? What is the unemployment rate? rate? Yo, do you understand that that unemployment rate that you are benefiting from, there are people who are pay paying the price in other nations. So when I tell you that every political system on earth, if it benefits you today, don't think that's the will of God necessarily. The question is, is the kingdom of God reflecting in this policy? Is there righteousness in this policy? Is there peace? Is there joy? Is the kingdom of God expanding? If you join me on your feet as you rise. shared this earlier. Yeah, let's give him a hand clap. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. You can, say, you, you can see this is a passion point. We both passionately love politics and government. Uh, we have a future in it one day. But one of the things I shared earlier is that a lot of times when you start talking about politics, those that have a religious spirit begin to get agitated and they begin to become irritated because the religious spirit is very much connected to a political party. It doesn't matter whether it's Republican, Democrat, it likes to hold on to what it's always had. And so when you begin to challenge thinking and beliefs and how things have always been, you can start getting, it feels like something is being pulled or taken away from you. Next month, we're going to be teaching on the kingdom of God, and it's going to happen some more. Because there is, a, a, we, we, we shape our identity based on where we were born, our experiences, and even though sometimes they're good, it's not necessarily God. And so when God is maturing us and raising us up to be able to see from the perspective of the kingdom, it requires certain parts of ourselves to die. It requires certain ideas, certain beliefs, certain things that we have championed that maybe were good, but not necessarily God to die. And so I will pray after you. Um, you want me to pray first? So God, we just thank you, Father, that even right now, I just see layers being removed. And some of you guys, you're like, hey, I'm not really into politics. I'm not really into government. This is why life happens to you and you don't happen to life. You always are on the receiving end of what everybody else is doing and all you can do is complain about where you're at and what's happening in the position instead of you being aware that you're seated in heavenly places, that before laws and agendas are established in the earth realm, we can get a peek, we can get a see, a, a, a view. I remember being in college and being attacked in my sleep by the, the, the demons that are same-sex demons. It came trying to wrestle me, succubus and incubus. And in the next year, policies were released all over the land concerning those uh, preferences and those rights. The Lord will show you what is to come before it even manifests. As kingdom citizens, we're not just recipients of what leadership does. We are able to step into the place of authority first in the place of prayer and declare your kingdom come, your will be done. And then in the place of, of voting and in the place of policy or place of education, wherever the Lord has set you to begin to release his kingdom in the earth realm. So no longer will we just receive what is being done. We just declare this morning that we're taking our authority as kingdom citizens, that we're not just people on the receiving end, but we are people that are sitting with God in heavenly places we're making policies on this earth for this earth that will go for generations I just put up a post recently that people are getting nervous because Hollywood artists are coming to the Lord most of them are getting nervous because they're going to lose influence but we've been prophesying this for 20 years this is what that which was prophesied but if you weren't in the stream of what God was saying 20 years ago things come as a shock to you but God we just thank you that we are seated in heavenly places that we don't only just receive bills and laws but we get to veto them we get to establish them in the spirit realm before they even manifest lord give us identity as kingdom citizens as those that walk in authority as those that walk in power as those that have been sent here every one of you is a sent one you are a sent one the more you the decision you make to be a believer you become an ambassador you're an ambassador from a different world. You're not shaped and you're not uh, pressed down. You're not overcome by the systems of this world. Lord, change our thinking. Change our mindset so we can walk in dominion and we can walk in authority.
Yeah, Father, we thank you, Lord, for kingdom mindset, God. We thank you for sons and daughters of the king. We thank you because we, our inheritance in you is to rule and reign with you, God, Jesus. And we divide spiritual matters even in the spirit. Lord, I thank you for an authority rising in this room. I thank you for authority rising in the hearts of your sons and daughters, God. Lord, I see authority rising in the spiritual realm, authority to divide and begin to take authority even over our local area, even our, our communities and our localities. That we begin to pray and begin to divide and break down every machination of the enemy and begin to establish the kingdom of God there. Righteousness and peace in our community. Righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That we will be led by the Holy Spirit. The kingdom agenda will be our agenda. The kingdom agenda will be our agenda. Every false narrative. And some of us, I just felt the Holy Spirit just dropped in us. Some of the reasons, some of the reasons, some of us have not prospered. Some of the reasons, some of us have not broken free, have not gotten deliverance in certain areas. It's because of our expectations and our ideologies. Our ideologies about what the government needs to do for us and how the government needs to operate. And Lord, I thank you for deliverance even in this hour. God, I thank you for delivering us, Lord, from the lie of the enemy that we belong to a social political class, that we belong to an hierarchy, we belong to a place in the system. I thank you because we are kingdom citizens. I thank you because we are rise above the, the barriers, we are rise above the bondage, we are rise above the, the, the limits set. Thank you for dominion. Thank you for dominion. Thank you for dominion. Step into your dominion. Come on, everybody in the church. If you don't have your tongue, pray in English. Yes, God. Come on. Take your authority. Take your authority. Come on. You're not praying yet. You haven't started yet. Come on. No music. No music. You are a lawmaker in the spirit. Begin to make laws in the spirit. You are a legislator in the spirit. Begin to make legislations in the spirit. Whoa. Come on, concerning your family, concerning yeah. things you're passionate about. Come on, church, let's pray. Let let's your pray. kingdom Instead come. Of complaining, pray. Let Instead your kingdom of come. Pray. Yeah. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth. Even as it is in heaven. Let your will be done on earth. Even as it is in heaven. Let your will be done on earth. Even as it is in heaven, Lord, we are not held bound by the policies of men. We're not held bound by the policies of our demographics. We're not held bound by the policies in our zip code. We're not held bound by the things, the government of this world. We are kingdom citizens. We operate from a kingdom perspective. We operate from a kingdom position. And Lord, we thank you because we're making laws even in the spirit realm that would establish your kingdom on earth, God. Let your kingdom come on earth. Let your will be done. Let righteousness reign. Let righteousness rule. Let righteousness reign. We pray for the leaders of this nation. We pray for the leaders of our communities. We pray for the leaders of the state. We pray for the leaders of this nation. Let your righteousness reign, God. Let your righteousness reign, God. That you will give them wisdom in their sleep. That you will give them wisdom in their board meetings. That you will give them wisdom on their play court. You will give them wisdom wherever they go. Lord, let your kingdom come, your will be done. Yes, Jesus. We need to pray for oppressive nations. Yeah. Some yeah. of us don't experience breakthrough in our communities because all we focus on is our communities. But in this moment, we focus on those outside of us. We focus on the nations that need more breakthrough than us. We focus on the people group that need more breakthrough than us. We stand in the gap for the oppressed. We stand in the gap for the weary. We stand in the gap for the broken. Come on. Just a couple more seconds. We've been praying for... 12 days now, your spirit should be stronger. There should be a level of stamina to be able to pray in the place of prayer without ceasing, without getting tired. Come on. Rebe, Koshoto, authority is gained in prayer. Come on. Rebe, Shoto. Scripture talks about intercession. It says to make intercession on behalf of all people. To make intercession on behalf of the nations. To make intercession on behalf of rulers. When you make intercession, you stand in the gap. When you make intercession, you intercede. 
you intercept. When you make a decision, you stand in the stand. Come on, come on. Those in the prison, those on the immigration line, God, we just stand in the gap. We stand in the gap. We stand.